So we saw that standing ovation when those visuals were shown. It looks like a game changer. It sounds like a game changer. Explain why it is. Let me say first, I'm very happy. My congratulations to all everybody involved. I know some of the people. Um, this was uh, this is a blue and white development with some very smart people in Israel who found an innovative way how to tackle and manipulate laser beams. And they were years ahead of the rest of the world. Now it's being copied in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, we are, what was demonstrated today was a 100 kilowatt laser. It goes by a power, which is very powerful, but not powerful enough yet, in my opinion. The United States is developing now a 300 kilowatt uh, laser based on the more or less the same technology. So uh, let's talk about the, the, the achievement is there, obviously. It's solid achievement. As an Israeli, I'm very proud. Uh, but uh, let us uh, be aware that is not going to replace, this is not a silver bullet. It's not going to replace Iron Dome. It's not going to replace uh, Aero 2 or Aero 3. This is going to supplement and reduce the cost uh, of the battle. It's, it's mostly about battle economies. So uh, the lasers have um, a, a advantage of a very cheap interception. I mean, it costs you to, to kill a rocket, costs you a few pennies instead of uh, $50,000, but the, the laser itself is very expensive. So it's a question here of the cheap guns firing expensive bullets, <laughs> whether the expensive gun firing cheap bullets. So the economy, uh, the battle economy is not that straightforward. You replace a problem of um, the economics of the, the cost of um, iron domes with the cost of lasers. It doesn't come for free. That cheap interception costs you a lot of money. That's one thing we have to find in mind. The other thing is that there are some natural limitations. First, weather is a limitation. I know that we are sitting here, it's now springtime, signs, sun is out, everybody's happy, <laughs> flowers are flowering. But remember that three or four weeks ago, we had a very hard winter. And uh, according to uh, statistics, in the north of Israel, uh, uh, near, near the Hezbollah, we have 40 to 60 rainy days a year. Okay. That's more than two months. More than two months if you add to that cloudy days, even without rain. So you need all your iron domes because sometimes you cannot use uh, the, the lasers. The other thing is the laser is the rate of fire. It, it, it works at the speed of light, but it doesn't kill at the speed of light. Right. It has to hit. And you could see the picture of it. It takes the time to cut off the, the wing of the of that, uh, uh, RPV, the remotely powered vehicle. So, um, but when you're talking about the situation like uh, last May, um, Shomer Achomot, when you had the uh, salvos of uh, 120, 130 rockets coming at the same time, you can assign some of them to the iron beam and most of them to the iron dome and save some iron domes again. You, you, you reduce the total cost of uh, your kill. So it's a great help. Also, when you're talking a situation like uh, uh, motor bombs, motor bombs are very marginal. You can, you can intercept uh, motor bombs with iron dome. Right. But it costs a lot of money to kill a very simple and cheap target. With the, with the laser, it makes more sense to use, uh, to, to, kill, to, to kill, to intercept. Uh, and the laser can do things which iron dome cannot do deal with anti-tank missiles. Oh, I'm sure the Russians would have liked to have something like that in Ukraine. Right. <laughs> so um, it, it's a great, a great achievement. And again, my, my congratulations to the guys who did it and to the state of Israel. You made reference to Guardian of the Wars, very fresh in the memories of people here when all those rockets came across, thousands of them coming across in May of last year. And people remember that threat from nearby. Give us an understanding of how the combination of this laser technology plus the Iron Dome plus existing missiles help when we talk about threats from further afield. Talk to us about the protection given by this laser technology being added to the defense strategy out of Israel. It will be added, in my opinion, for the time being, with the powers that we have now, which I said is not in the highest level, it's only 100 kilowatt, it will mainly be a closed, closed defense against the shorter range, shorter range uh, threats. 
um, uh, and, and the smaller kind of rockets. Uh, I don't see uh, a system like that being very useful against uh, something that comes from Iran. It's, it's a big animal, a big missile with a lot of uh, thermal protection, well protected against lasers. So we, we are not there yet, maybe in the future. What we are in, and you're talking about regular guards being fired at Shdeot or Ashkelon, um, uh, there I think the laser can be of tremendous help. And give us an idea of time frames, because what we were seeing today were the first series of tests, but there are many underway still. How long until this is likely to be operational? Very briefly, please. Even if I knew, I wouldn't share it with you. But uh, I, I really <laughs> don't know. Us. Look, uh, we saw a system. There's one of the things which I very liked very much in what I saw today was something that wasn't stressed. It's a small system on a truck. It's a mobile system. Right. It's not the old Nautilus, which was a whole chemical factory that you needed a whole train of uh, logistic train in order to move it. This moves on a truck. So um, the, the question is how much it costs, how much money we'll have in order to allocate it to it, and how fast it can be manufactured. One alone is experimental. It doesn't do the work. We'll need many. Well, it certainly is a fascinating experiment, as you put it. Thank you so much for your insight and for breaking down what this all means for the defense strategy out of the country. Dr. Uzi Rubin, thank you for being here in studio.